Great. Well, thank you all for coming tonight uh, to our program, Secret Societies in Detroit with Bill Loomis. Tonight's program is a webinar format, so we can't see you or hear you, but feel free to use the chat or the Q&A features at any time to ask questions. And I'll read those off to Bill at the end of the program. Our presenter tonight is Bill Loomis. Bill has written for the Detroit News, Michigan History Magazine, Our Detroit, Crane's Business Detroit, and even the New York Times. He has been interviewed on the PBS radio show, Splendid Table, He's a regular contributor to Stateside with Cynthia Canty on PBS, WUOM in Ann Arbor. Bill has authored a, a number of books on the history of the Motor City, Detroit's Delectable Past, Detroit Food, and On This Day in Detroit History. His latest book is Secret Societies in Detroit. Welcome, Bill, and I'll turn the screen over to you. Uh, probably a pleasure being here today to talk about this subject. Um, I got interested in this subject um, when I did an article for the Detroit News on the fraternal clubs in Detroit, which were very popular in the Victorian days and in the early 20th century. These were the, the well-known known clubs like the Moose or the Elks or the Shriners. And, um, but as I got into the subject more, I found that there was a lot more depth to these clubs and many people joined clubs for a variety of different reasons. It wasn't just for friendship and companionship. Um, Uh, people belong to clubs um, in the Victorian, in Detroit, um, by, the, by the Victorian era, one in five adult males were members of one club or another. Um, membership in the Detroit uh, Freemasons grew to 40,000 men in 1919 with separate lodges, 60 separate lodges. Um, People, men belong to, especially men, but there were also women's clubs, but men belong to at least one club, but and many men belong to four or five clubs. Um, in 1916, Detroit was labeled the number one destination for club conventions by the National Tourist Board. So we had not only clubs here, but we had great conventions coming in of these, club, of these clubs as well. In 1897, 100,000 Shriners held their convention in Detroit. In 1920, 20,000 Freemasons marched in the Thanksgiving Day Parade up Woodward Avenue. And in 1950, the Detroit City Women's Club was the largest women's club in the world. Um, it's amazing, but nowadays you meet people and there's very few people you'll meet that are actually in clubs any longer. But that was, uh, that was back then. Um, the reason people belong to clubs um, was, uh, a combination of things. Uh, you got to remember that uh, these started before there were even telephones. And so the only way you could meet somebody was either through direct contact or through a letter letter writing. So there was a lot of loneliness out there. In fact, in, in the Detroit Free Press, there was a regular weekly column called, um, Are Men Lonelier Than Women? And people would, would write in and say um, that they were very lonely, that kind of stuff. A lot of people worked at uh, lived or worked on farms uh, where it was very difficult to meet and and uh, just engage with other people. So clubs were essential. Um, they joined these clubs for friendship, of course, uh, that would be the main reason, but also for business contacts. It gave people a way to um, interact with, on a business way with people they'd already met and knew uh, to accomplish or prevent something. They were goal-driven or they were uh, trying to put a stop to something. Uh, many of, of them were charity driven. Um, for politics, there were a lot of political clubs that were really outside the mainstream politics. Um, then for social advancement, that was another reason that they they joined clubs. A lot of clubs like the Masons were once very prestigious uh, organizations to belong to. The, the city leaders belonged to certain clubs. And um, also, they did it for more mundane reasons like benefits. Uh, waiters uh, might form a club, or um, the Elks Club was actually founded by waiters uh, who wanted the benefits of uh, uh, sick sick pay. 
uh, they had only the their, their only pay. There was no insurance, of course, back then of any kind, social insurance or other. So they would join clubs to pool money together to start insurance benefits. And then, unfortunately, some of the clubs were based on fear and envy and hatred. And I'll talk about a couple of those this, this evening, too. Um, the granddaddy of all clubs, of course, uh, were the Freemasons, and they started um, in the in the 1300s over in Europe. They were actually the Masons who built the cathedrals, uh, the stone Masons, and um, they worked uh, building cathedrals and nunneries and monasteries for the Catholic Church. So much of their symbolism, even today, is based on tools of masonry, like the compass here or, or a, a, a ruler or something of those sorts of things. Um, the, uh, the Masons uh, have been in Detroit or have been in the United States from the very beginning and were a very important part of our country. Uh, George Washington, standing here, was a master Mason. And um, 14 US presidents were Masons. Um, the last was Gerald Ford. Uh, and 21 signers of the Declaration of Independence were Masons. Uh, and it's said by historians that a lot of the um, ideas and concepts of the Constitution are, have their roots in Masonry. The reason they're called Freemasons was that um, they were independent from the Catholic Church. They did not, they were not part of the Catholic Church. So um, they uh, were like independent contractors, if, if you would. Uh, Masons started in Detroit in 1764, uh, a few years after the British took over Detroit from the French. And um, the first Mas Masonic Lodge in Detroit was started by a British soldier named John Christie. And um, they met in a guardhouse at, in Fort Detroit. It was the first Masonic Lodge west of the Alleghenies. Um, the other was in New York. And um, in over 20 years, it had modest growth to a group of four lodges. Um, so it was not, not a real big rush, but there weren't very many people in Detroit anyway. But it was always the, the upper echelon of, of a society were usually in the Masons. Um, they were uh, the major contributor um, to the start of the University of Michigan. They donated uh, 210 or no $2,100 out of $3,000 uh, to, to put up seed money to begin the university. Um, it continued to grow uh, over time and, and just grow, grew exponentially as the city grew. And uh, by 1920, um, they were bursting at the seams. They built um, temple after temple. And finally, they decided on a, a big, expensive, major investment. And they had a, an architect named George Mason design the Masonic Temple that we know. This is the groundbreaking that you see here for the Masonic Temple on Thanksgiving Day, November 25th, 1920. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was uh, at the ceremony and gave a talk. And um, it was uh, quite an affair. Um, the temple itself, shown right here, is um, designed, as said, by George Mason, who was the architect. And um, it, he said he designed it with the, Mason, the Masons' um, masonry beginnings. Uh, so it's meant to look like a cathedral. Um, and uh, it really does. Um, the inside, if you ever have a chance to go in it, you, must, you should take it. Uh, it was mainly the, the design of Corrado Parducci, who was an arch architectural artist and sculptor who did many, many sculptures and, and buildings in, uh, the, in Detroit. You see his, his sculptures everywhere in Detroit. It's a spectacular place. Um, on a different note, a completely different note, was the Know Nothings. Um, it was really the beginning of what I call violent politics. Um, this was in your face uh, politics that uh, was 
brass knuckles all the way. Um, it, they began um, in the 1830s when the, the number of Catholic immigrants from Ireland and then later from Germany started coming in um, in droves, in, in huge numbers. At one point, um, about 600,000 people came over from Ireland and Europe that were um, and settled in the United States in, in 1840. Um, it was about 3% of the US population. And so people began to get very edgy about that. There's this traditional Protestant Catholic um, animosity and history of violence. And um, some Americans were getting really upset that, that they, were, they might take over. Um, and they were losing political clout. Um, they were, they were started, the, the Know Nothings began from the Whig Party, which in the, just before the Civil War, the Whig Party went out of business. Um, and what was left were the extreme conservatives of the party. And they called, they started their own party and they called it the Order of the Star Spangled Banner. Uh, and it was known derisively as the Know Nothings, um, especially in the press. Uh, but by 1850, uh, two thirds of the of the foreign born were Catholics, so that was becoming a real serious issue for these people. Uh, it began in the slums of New York City in the 1850s, and they were ramrodding candidates through, stuffing ballot boxes, using extreme violence, uh, shouting down um, uh, moderate Republicans who were uh, <laughs> Whigs who might be, um, and trying to portray, portray them as indecisive. Uh, and using fear to win elections. It was also the time of a new movement called nativism in America, and that was not Native Americans as we know them, but Native Americans in the 1840s and 50s were American, white American born males with parents who were born, both born in America as well. Um, and this picture here shows, let's see if I get it. Shows uh, the ideal, uh, the ideal American in the views of, of the know nothings, um, handsome and Protestant and, and white and male. During the day, the most famous of the know nothings was William Poole, who was also known as Bill the Butcher. And if you ever saw the movie Slums in New York, um, Bill the Butcher is the main character played by Daniel Day Lewis, I think. And um, it was uh, it was a rough time, that's for sure. The Know Nothings came to Detroit in the 1850s. They first settled in Kalamazoo, uh, and then they came over to Detroit. And they had a mayor that uh, they a candidate for mayor they wanted, um, and they also had people they set up for to serve on the councils, the common city council. Um, the mayor. Um, let me get him up. Henry Porter Baldwin ran um, for the mayor. And he was he was unsuccessful. He lost to Henry Ledger, um, but he uh, later in in his political career he rejected the Know Nothings and successfully ran for the governor of Michigan twice as a Republican, and he was considered quite a good governor. Um, this was from the Detroit Free Press, August 12th, 1854, the Detroit Free Press wrote, riots and street fights, broken heads and black eyes have been among the minor trophies of this institution. The Know Nothings dissolved uh, with the start of the Republican Party, really. Um, that when they lost, when people lost their fear of Catholics and worried more about abolishing slavery and the coming potential civil war. Um, that's when the, the Know Nothings faded away. Uh, during the Civil War, um, there were secret Confederate spy rings in Detroit uh, and in, set out to destroy Detroit. Um, during the Civil War, the British sided with the South. And um, so therefore, they were ha happy in Canada, which was British. British colony, 
to um, have har harbor uh, Confederate spies um, who operated out of Toronto. There was a, a fellow named Jacob Thompson who uh, uh, worked out of Toronto and sometimes out of Windsor. Uh, Detroit felt especially vulnerable to uh, to the British in, in the north of Can in Canada because it was felt that they might send soldiers over to fight for the south, in which case they might attack Detroit. Uh, that didn't happen. But um, the, the spies were definitely there. Um, the Confederacy at during the Civil War believed um, that the Midwest was more sympathetic uh, in those days, it was the Northwest, but the Midwest was more sympathetic to the Confederate states than it, than it was than was the rest of the United States, the Eastern uh, seaboard in New England. Um, the Confederacy bought all the farm produce from uh, from the Midwest. Therefore, they were they they thought of the Midwest as a potential Northwestern Confederacy, which if, if they could con convert. Uh, and join the, they hope to convert and join the corporate, uh, the Confederate states in the South. Um, that was one of uh, Jacob Thompson's prime motivators. He, he was, he was trying to, hoping to demoralize the North with either sort of terrorist acts or other acts and have them turn away from Lincoln and uh, oppose the war and join the Confederacy or just ha have them end the war. Um, so to do that in Detroit, what he planned to do, he, he hired this man, uh, John Yates Beal. And John Yates Beal was a Confederate young man. He was, a, in a, he was 31 years old. Uh, he was an aristocrat. He, is a gra he was a graduate of the University of Virginia. Um, he was a, a, a high-end roller. And... Um, he fought for Stonewall Jackson, uh, where he was uh, seriously wounded and couldn't go back to the battlefield anymore. But he was still dedicated to the cause, so he joined this, the the um, Confederate spies in in Canada. So Thompson sent Beale and twenty five other men to Windsor, Ontario, and they stayed in a hotel that was called the Castle Hotel, and they plotted out a plan to burn down Detroit and uh, at so confusion in the North. Um, the plan was that they would start a fire on the, on the grass road, which, is, which was a little ways outside of Detroit. And as the fire department went out to put out that fire, they would start fires in the hotels and, in the, and put dynamite in the stores and start fire on the, on the ships on the docks. Um, they were in their last rehearsal to carry this out when one of the men, on the team didn't show up and Beale realized what that meant. That meant that he he quit the team and he quit the spy ring and had perhaps ratted them out. So they quickly ended that plan. But Jacob Thompson wasn't done. Jacob Thompson um, wanted Beale to um, to take over a uh, to take over a freight a, a ferry boat and make his way to a place called Johnson's Island, which was a Confederate prisoner of war camp. As the, as the war went on and the South kept losing men, they were really running out of men, and especially officers. So they were, it was a priority to try to find, to try to maybe get back their prisoners, prisoners of war and get them back fighting for the South. Um, so uh, Beale was assigned with the other men to take the ferry boat to Johnson's Island, which was near Cedar Point, and um, um, get the men free. The problem was that there was the only U.S. gunboat on the Great Lakes was the USS Michigan, and it was guarding Johnson's Island. It was right there in the way. So they couldn't get past that. Um, so uh, the way they would do it is J J Jacob Thompson had a spy planted on the gunboat named Cole, and Cole, at the right time, was told to drug the, the food of the officers during a dinner. And um, they would, once they were knocked out, he would signal from the boat with a swinging lantern to Beale on the ferry boat that the boat, the, the gunboat was in their control. And they would take over the gunboat, uh, send it 
um, sail it over to uh, Johnson's Island and free the, free the Southern prisoners. Well, um, Beal did indeed, um, Beal did indeed get the gunboat. Um, no, I mean, Cole got on the gunboat. He was on the gunboat, but he was, they were tipped off that Cole was a spy. So they arrested Cole. And so as Beal was on the ferry boat with his other men, he commodore the, the boat, he kicked the passengers off and they all, he pulled a gun on the captain and said, I'm a Confederate officer, you were under my control and you are to do what I tell you. So they started sailing the boat up toward uh, Cedar Point. And by the time they reached Johnson's Island, it was 12 midnight and it was the time of the rendezvous, but there was no signal. And so Beale knew that something had gone wrong. So he, he wanted to go forward anyway, but um, the men on the, on his uh, ferry boat, the, the Philo Parsons said, no, he had to turn back. So he did. Uh, they got back to Windsor at 3 a.m. in the morning and um, uh, he, he unfurled the Confederate flag and they proceeded to sink the Philo Parsons ferry boat and, and vandalize it and sink it. Um, the men were picked up by the police um, and uh, but Beale escaped and he and Thompson escaped and he went on to um, Ni on Niagara Falls and, and they went to New York where they decided they would uh, sabotage a train and um, that train uh, they would derail it with some things put on the track. Uh, he got caught by a, a Canadian policeman who saw a, a flyer alerting uh, to his presence and um, he was captured and taken to the to New York where he was sentenced to be executed. Um, and uh, after uh, the negotiations, uh, he was executed. Uh, he was this only the first execution in New York since the hanging of uh, Major John Andre, a British Army officer who was a, as a spy was uh, was executed as a spy by George Washington. So that was the end of the spy ring in Detroit. Of course, um, everyone knows how important Detroit was in the Underground Railroad. Um, and um, generally speaking, the uh, image of the Underground Railroad, um, it was actually Detroit was the most important site in the western part of the United States. Um, and the image though of the, of the or the belief of the, of the Underground Railroad was that it was uh, Quaker liberal um, farmers who were sympathetic to the um, abolition and um, would hide slaves in their barns or in their cellars or wherever they could uh, to hide them and help them and, and uh, as they went along, feed them and clothe them and keep them moving forward. And that was true. But there were other, there was another side to that story. Um, there was a group, there was a group in, uh, in Detroit that was headed by this man. His name is William Lambert. Uh, and he was an outstanding individual. And um, he uh, founded the first black church with others. He founded the first black church in Detroit, the second Baptist church. Um, he was actually a wealthy man. He was a very successful businessman. He came originally from Buffalo and he got um, a job on one of the, the freighters um, on the Great Lakes and ended up spending some time in Detroit, which he really liked, so he stayed. Um, and right away, he, um, this was in the 1830s, and in the eight, but by the 1850s, he decided he had to get involved in the Underground Railroad and um, due to the Fugitive Slave Act, which made it very dangerous to bring for a fugitive slaves leaving the South and getting to Canada. Um, so what he would do is he had large wagons with false bottoms and he would take them down to the South. And once he'd located some fugitive slaves, he could hide three fugitive slave slaves in the bottom of these wagons. He would bring them up through the 
back roads up to up to western Michigan, then across the state of Michigan to Detroit, where he had boats and um, he would ferry them across over to Canada. They did, he said, they did sixteen hundred people a year uh, in this in this process. Um, and over the time of the of the pre Civil War days, uh, they did uh, forty thousand people. Uh, so he was very active. Uh, he had help doing this, and that was with uh, this man, George de Baptiste, uh, who was also a wealthy black businessman in Detroit. Uh, very successfully, he came from Missouri, uh, made his way up to Detroit, and he owned a series of barber shops. And he owned a catering business. He owned a bakery and different things. Uh, but he was also uh, a very good manager um, and hit boats down in Wyandotte and uh, with Lambert, he would get the people on these boats uh, successfully, never never got caught once uh, and over to out of Amersburg across the across in Canada. One of the most unusual uh, clubs or societies that I ran into in this was this Christian sect called the Disciples of the Flying Roll. And um, they were uh, very unusual people, but they decided that um, their sect was started by a woman named Joanna Southcourt, Southcott in Devon, England. Uh, she was an Irish maid, and as but as she got older, she started having visions of um, from religious visions, and um, she would talk to crowds gathering in the marketplace and to crowds that, and audiences. And she said at one time she had 10,000 people at some of her meetings, which in those days was a lot. Um, but she died and her followers split into different sects. And one of the sects was headed by a man named James Jezreel, who wrote a book and, told, and be, declared himself the sixth messenger of, of the angel Michael. Um, and uh, his book, he sold all over, or he peddled everywhere, and he came to America, and one of several stops he made in Michigan, one was in Detroit, and one was in Grand Rapids, and one was in Benton Harbor. Um, what they believed, the flying roll, was um, that Christians at that time were mistaken by following only the, the Christian, the New Testament Gospels. Um, they had to also follow the laws of the Old Testament. So they were also Nazarites, so they never cut their hair. They didn't smoke or drink. Um, they ate only kosher food. And um, in general, they were, um, they didn't, oh, they didn't believe in marriage, um, which was part of their downfall. But um, they also, uh, uh, we're, we're beginning, uh, they saw Detroit as the, the place of incoming, where in gathering, where people would come from all over. The Flying Roll was a, a quote, it was a section from the Old Testament book of Zechariah, in which the prophet Zechariah says, uh, he, I turned my eyes, lifted, I turned and I lifted my eyes and I looked and behold a flying roll. And when he says flying roll, think scroll, that's what he was talking about. Uh, and on the scroll were, according to the disciples of the flying roll, were the list, uh, was a list God made of 144,000 names. They were 12,000 names from the 12 tri tribes of Israel. And those names were the people who would be saved and saved from a horrible death and the end of the world that was coming. So um, that's basically what drove them. Um, and... Uh, at that same time that Jezreel was over, another man came over from uh, Ontario. His name was Michael Mills, and he came with his wife, Rosetta Cole, close, I'm sorry, Rosetta Close. And um, they were, uh, he was, he came to Sarnia, and then he came to Port Huron, and then he arrived in Detroit. And in Detroit, he got a copy of Jezreel's book. He read it, and it really moved him. Up until then, he had lived a very uneventful life. And this was a, a truly life-changing event for him. Um, but he uh, decided to sell the books and he, and he went on the road and sold these books 
for a few years. And then when he came back, he declared himself the seventh messenger of the Michael, Gabriel Michael, Angel Michael, and uh, called himself Prince Michael now. He was no longer just Michael, he was Prince Michael. And um, he was going to make Detroit the ingathering place uh, for all the tribes, all the people that are on the scroll uh, or others who wanted to be saved. They would gather in Detroit. It was the new Mecca. And um, he had some followers, a few, and they, and like many of these sects, you had to give them all of your belongings and money. And um, they would do that. And then they came up to Detroit and Michael Mills um, bought houses on Hamlin Street, north of, uh, north of the Grand Boulevard. It's now Bethune Street, uh, little houses there. It was then quite a quite a bit north of the city, and um, they stayed in those houses, um, and that was their that's where they lived. Um, everything was going on pretty well um, until his wife Rosetta Close um, filed for divorce, and then it went public, and she claimed that he was having sex with other women in the in the sect, and that. Uh, she was being tortured by him and and constrained with ropes and chairs and things like this. And it was all very lurid stuff. And uh, the paper covered it in great detail. But it started the Detroiters against the sect. Um, the people in the neighborhood were resentful that they owned houses there because mobs of young men, college boys would come up and throw stones at the house, throw tar at the house and make noise and uh, make a big scene. Uh, and people were aghast at the, what was going on there. Uh, what really closed the deal for the disciples of the flying roll was that it was told that um, Michael Mills ended up having sex with an underage woman there, a 15 year old named Bernice. Um, and she was the daughter of two of the two of the members of the sect and she played piano during the services. And uh, it came out that Michael Mills um, spent, and his assistant, um, Eliza Court, uh, spent long hours trying to convince her, keeping her up all night, convincing her that it was her duty to sleep with Michael. And uh, that, um, and even her parents, the poor girl's parents were saying, uh, he is God. If he wants you to be his wife, you are his wife and it's your duty to sleep with Michael. Well, finally she caved in. And uh, it got though in the paper and the and her parents, uh, Bernice's parents said, uh, "It's he's God. It's it's perfectly fine that she sleeps with him." Well, the, the courts didn't agree, and they sent Michael Mills to prison, Jackson Prison, which uh, pretty much ended the sect. But um, it was over. But uh, sometime later, about uh, twenty years later, the sect was revived. Um, the sect. Uh, here they are in about 1920. Um, uh, Franklin or uh, Benjamin Purnell and his wife Mary Purnell um, started the sect. He was a broom salesman, believe it or not, uh, and a Kentucky preacher. Uh, but he had convinced um, a, a person who donated 108 acres in Benton Harbor to him uh, to start the sect there. Um, which he did. Uh, he ended up uh, buying a mansion there, this one, which they called um, Shiloh. Uh, this is kind of a bad picture, I'm sorry. But um, it was big. And um, they were much more practical and entrepreneurial than, than uh, Michael Mills. Um, they started out, they had all kinds of things going. They had a, they had a amusement park they started, which brought in 100,000 people to Benton Harbor uh, over a summer. They had ice cream parlors, they had a, uh, they had a trains, they had little trains set up, they had uh, a baseball team um, that, that played pro baseball, basically. Uh, they didn't play on the, with the pros during the season because they refused to refuse them because of their hair and their beards. Uh, but they played the pro teams like the Yankees or the Cubs in the off season, and they were quite good. People came a long ways to see them play. 
Um, they also had things like a band. Um, and uh, generally it was a, a really going thing. It was uh, very popular. People loved it. They had bakeries and they had electricians and they had all kinds of things going on. Um, what did them in was again, uh, like Michael Mills, Benjamin Purnell was accused of having sex with underage women in the sect, and uh, that drove people crazy. Um, and so they turned against him. But even today, uh, there's a few members left in Benton Harbor. Um, they're very old, and um, uh, they are uh, they were successful. And people in Benton Harbor still have very fond feelings for the people. They said they were kind and very responsible uh, neighbors to have, and they were they have only good memories from the amusement parks and things like that. One of the more of the under the category of fear and hatred um, was the Ku Klux Klan. And um, they were very popular in Detroit in the 1920s. Um, the Klan had um, had two phases. The first phase was right after the Civil War. Um, the Confederate uh, officers, generals, and uh, some other officers led a group of, of like a mob at night on horseback to terrorize black people into staying out of politics and to not rising above their low, low level status. Um, Congress in 1871 passed a, a law that said this and it put an end to that, um, made it illegal. Um, and uh, so they died out. But in eight, 1915, uh, this fellow, uh, William Joseph Simmons at Stone Mountain, Georgia, uh, began the, the new Ku Klux Klan. And this was the Klan that we associate and, and recognize more readily with the pointed white robes and the cone hats and all that stuff and hoods. And uh, at the same time, there was a movie that came out called A uh, Birth of a Nation, which uh, was basically about the Klan and um, uh, was very popular. Uh, it was uh, the purifying of America, sort of. Sort of. And um, so it was. there was a lot of public um, interest and sentiment for the Klan, actually. Um, they came up to Detroit uh, really in about 1920. Um, they, uh, these are cross raisings uh, for meetings and rallies in Dearborn. And um, they had cross burnings right downtown Detroit. In 1920 though, they sent over a, a recruiter, which they called a Klegel to Detroit. And by 1921, they had 3000 members um, signed up for the Klan. Um, but, and it grew. By 1923, they were up to 22,000 members. And by 19, um, it really, by 1924, uh, they got to their largest number, which were 32,000 32, members. It didn't start out as an anti-Black um, or white supremacist organization. Uh, in Detroit, they, they were very popular um, in small towns, especially, uh, it's related to the pro prohibition of uh, n no drinking alcohol uh, laws. Um, what happened was the small towns really liked the prohibition laws. Detroit did not like them at all. And um, so there was a lot of uh, disregard for the prohibition law in Detroit with who's coming over from uh, Windsor, from Canada, there was a lot of speakeasies and, and blind pigs. And the people in this, especially the preachers in the small town, uh, assumed either that the cops were, the police were corrupt and not enforcing the laws, or that uh, Catholics coming over from Europe 
uh, were the source of these problems, um, Polish and Germans especially, which had beer halls and dancing on Sundays and had disregard for any any of the Protestant um, laws in in our in our in America. Um, because of this, uh, the Klan came at the perfect time. Here was a a group of vigilantes that were going to enforce the law that the police were not. Uh, so they were only too happy to have the Klan starting up. And in Detroit, um, it took hold as uh, people were threatened by Catholics as well. And this was before the great migration of, of black people from the South. But uh, Detroit even had a, a mayor, a mayoral candidate who was a Ku Klux Klan member. He was, he was a lawyer, his name was Charles Bowles. And Bowles ran for mayor in 1925 uh, as a write-in candidate. Um, everybody was panicked in the established democ in the stem established political parties, thinking that um, they couldn't be the a big city in in the United States and have a Ku Klux Klan member as a as a mayor. That just wasn't going to make it. But he almost won. If he if he. It was the biggest turnout for an election to date. They had over 300,000 voters. And uh, one of the other candidates had decided that uh, since he was a writing candidate, there, there were many misspellings of his name. And unless his name was spelled correctly, Charles Bowles, uh, they weren't counting the vote. And this took away 12,000 votes from Charles Bowles. People were putting down C-H-A-S period and uh, that kind of stuff. And it wasn't considered acceptable. So basically, the, the election uh, ended with Bowles losing. Um, that was the beginning kind of of the downfall of the Ku Klux Klan in Detroit. They, uh, they never really recovered that well from that political loss. Um, uh, but they did gain traction with, um, as more and more blacks uh, moved up north, uh, this became a very stressful thing for Detroiters who were already there, the white Detroiters. Um, they were, the blacks moving to the north were forced into segregated neighborhoods and they were way too small. Um, so they, they put pressure on everyone to, they were bursting at the seams basically. And anybody who had money or any means were buying, trying to buy houses outside of the segregated areas. And this was the case with Dr. Ocean Sweet uh, this is his house. It's become now a, a historic marked house uh, in, on, in Detroit. Um, Dr. Sweet uh, bought the house and uh, he was uh, having a party with his family in the house when um, a mob surrounded the house, began pelting the house with bottles and rocks and shouting. And um, he had his extended family over. They had a uh, they were having a party and uh, they were beginning to panic. And one of the relatives of Dr. Sweet uh, took out a rifle and shot one of the people in the mob. Uh, the police came in, accused the whole family of murder, and it went to court in a famous, nationally famous, uh, oops, a nationally famous event uh, with Frank Murphy as the presiding uh, presiding judge and uh, Clarence Darrow as the as the defense for the suites. Uh, the, the suites won and uh, they continued. And with that loss, that was pretty much the end of the Klan uh, in Detroit. They closed the doors in 1931. Um, the last group I want to talk about, this is an interesting group. Um, this was a, a Nazi spy group in Detroit. Um, Nazi spies in Detroit were oh, Nazi spies in Detroit were uh, quite prevalent. The FBI at the beginning of World War II had eight officers in, in Detroit, mainly to control gang violence. Uh, by the end of the war, there were over 600 officers in Detroit working um, to protect the, the, the city from Nazi spies in the country. Um, this man, Max Stefan, um, was a German uh, police officer at the end of World War I. He'd been a soldier. He was a police officer in Cologne. He, he immigrated to Canada with his wife and opened a tavern. 
in Windsor, and she and on the second floor she ran a prostitute ring. Um, he decided he wanted to he very much wanted to move to America, which he thought would give him many more opportunities, especially in Detroit's German German areas. Um, so eventually, after uh, some time, he did come to Detroit and opened a German restaurant on a West on East Grand Boulevard. And uh, from there, though, uh, he operated, it was a large restaurant, like a, almost a beer hall in the back, where at night, he would, they would hold Nazi rallies, pro-Nazi rallies. In fact, Stefan ran them. Um, so the FBI knew this. He was, he was a well-known figure in, to them. Um, about this time, um, a man, a German officer, of the Luftwaffe uh, was shot down over London during the Battle of Britain and was wounded. He was he was brought back to health and sent as a prisoner of war to Canada. Um, there he was uh, stationed outside of uh, Toronto, and uh, they. Uh, <clears throat> he was outside of Toronto, and he decided he had to escape. That was his duty as a soldier. So uh, he, one of the things that Stefan did in his spare time was he organized uh, women in Detroit to send sort of care packages, boxes of uh, toiletry kits, and underwear, uh, stamps, and letters, letter writing things to these prisoners. It was it was legal and an agreement between the American and German government that they would be allowed to do this. Along with all those things in inside the box were the name and the address of the person who put the box together. Um, in this case, uh, uh, it was um, Margareta uh, Bethel Barrelman. Uh, Margareta Barrelman lived in a little house with her husband over toward almost to Gross Point off of Adelaide Road. And um, he, uh, one day, uh, when Krug got loose, uh, got out of the prisoner of war camp, he made his way to Windsor. And there on the water, on the river, he stole a rowboat, uh, paddled it over to uh, Detroit. And in Detroit, um, got out and started walking and walked to uh, uh, Bettelman's uh, home, the Bettelman home on a Saturday morning. And there he knocked on her screen door she answered the door and he said, I'm a prisoner of war. And he showed her the epaulets from his uniform. She knew right away what this meant. And she was very scared. She was very frightened. She wasn't actually a citizen yet. So she knew that if she got caught with this man, uh, it would be the end of her life in Detroit. Uh, she'd be sent back to Germany at best. So uh, um, she called Max Stefan, who came up in his big Buick and uh, talked to the young man. Uh, and decided that uh, the man said, I've got to escape, it's my duty. So he decided he would help him. So he took him uh, down to downtown Detroit, bought him some clothes and a new wallet, uh, gave him a little cash. But then he's, he sort of paraded him around to all his friends as a, uh, as a sort of a celebrity. Um, and uh, that was not a smart thing to do. Um, so one of the people he showed him to was Theodore Denae, who was a World War I veteran uh, with a, a scar from a saber scar on his cheek and everything. He was a very tall man. And uh, he uh, really liked Krug and decided, gave him $20 and uh, wished him luck. Um, but the, one of the, the clerks in Denae's uh, office overheard the conversation and called the FBI and said that this man was here. The um, um, Max Stefan took the man back. He got him a hotel room and bought him a bus ticket. He wanted to go to Chicago where, where he had another another contact. And his plan was to move, um, make his way down to Texas to San Antonio uh, and then make his way over to Mexico, which was neutral during the war. And from there, he could go down to Mexico City and get his get a way back to Germany. Well, um, the, the hotel clerk in San Antonio recognized that he had a thick accent and called the called the FBI. They picked him up, and uh, 
he was brought back to Detroit, uh, where they immediately arrested Stefan, uh, Max Stefan. Max Stefan was in trouble. Um, he thought maybe with him captured, uh, they would go more lenient. They did just the opposite. They said he was going to be tried for treason and would be executed. Um, Max Stefan, um, the, the case of his lawyers was that Stefan was just helping a, a young German man in need. And the, the case of the prosecutor said, no way, this is an act of war. Uh, so uh, they won. Uh, Krug uh, inconceivably testified against Max Stefan. And it was to the consternation of his lawyers. Um, but um, in any event, um, Max Stefan was sentenced to hang. He lost. It was devastating to Stefan, and he was taken to the to taken to the penitentiary, and uh, it was until nine hours before his his execution he was um, freed, and it was commuted by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who said, um, just like there are different levels of murder, there are different levels of treason, and uh, this this wasn't something he should be hung for. This was more like murder in the second degree. Um, so he was sentenced to life in prison. Um, but he didn't live long. He had he ended up with liver cancer and um, passed away. Uh, Krug went on to live in Germany. He actually went back to the prison, escaped again, and got back to Germany. But in 1992, when he was in his 70s, the Free Press went over and interviewed him about the events. And uh, Oddly, he said he, he could remember the details of the events, but he couldn't remember how he felt or any of the emotions of the time, but uh, he was doing OK. So that's a sample of the groups that I've been researching that are in the book. There are many more uh, that I couldn't cover here, of course, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions if you have anything uh, you want to talk about. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. And uh, yes, if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to use the chat or the Q&A at this time, and I'll I'll keep watch over that. Okay. All right. Okay. Going once, going twice. Well, thank you so much, Bill. I really appreciate you sharing your time and expertise with us this evening. Thank you. And uh, have a wonderful rest of the summer. Okay, you too. Thanks again for inviting me. Sure. Bye-bye.